Aloha, and welcome to Thumbing Through Yesterday, the podcast where we take our favorite books off the bookshelf, dust them off, and remind ourselves why they're important to us. Joining me today, we've got Tony Pasculi. Yeah, uh, and not uh, downloading my favorite books onto a Kindle, because that's because my eyes are so bad these days, but I think the principle is the same. Yeah, it is. It is. I, I confess that I read the, uh, the book for episode two off of a Kindle, although... Uh, for this first episode, I did pull my cherished, tattered paperback off the shelf. It loses pages every time I open it now, but uh, still, it's it's preserve worthy. Absolutely. Uh, so we're talking about uh, Watership Down today. That Watership was your Down pick by Richard Adams. Yes, one yeah. of my one of my favorite novels. If I were pushed to list a favorite novel, I think this would be the one I would go with. And that's that's my big question for you because. If I were pushed to name a favorite novel, I could not do it, and yet you have. And so how does this rise to the absolute top of the heap? What makes this your favorite novel? What does that even mean, oh, to that's, be a favorite novel? <laughs> that's, that is a tricky question, isn't it? What does it mean to be a favorite novel? Uh, it's kind of like picking a favorite movie or a favorite song. I mean, in a way, it's an impossible choice. Um, but if you step back and look at it objectively and you say, what novel have I picked up and read from cover to cover more times than any other novel? Um, the list of novels I've read more than three or four times becomes very short. Mm. Um, and this one just always gives me joy when I decide it's time to pick it up again. That's a great metric. Um, yeah, I've certainly got books that I've read multiple, multiple times. This is not one of them. I remember enjoying this the first time I read it, uh, but I never had the urge to ba go back and revisit it. So it was interesting to go back and it's been... Lord, uh, decades since I first read it. Uh, so how many times have you read Watership Down? You know, honestly, I don't know. I, I haven't kept count. Um, I know that when we moved to Hawaii, I was delighted. I, I left behind so many things when we left the mainland, right? And, and yeah. books were among the first things to get sacrificed. Needless weight. <laughs> um, so we were at a, either a library sale or a used bookstore. I'm, I'm, I think it was at a library sale. And I came across it and I was just delighted. Uh, you know, I got to pick my new friend back up and I think it cost me $3. Um, so. Wow. It's expensive for a library sale. For a library sale, it was high <laughs> price. But again, this, this is a book that I cherish. So. Yeah. And honestly, I can't even tell you the first time I read it. I, I think it was actually relatively, relatively later in life. You would think that this is a childhood book, right? Something I might have picked up in grade school or maybe high school, but I'm pretty sure it was late college when I stumbled across it. Oh, that is, that is fascinating because I think uh, that, is, that is late to be discovering a favorite book. Uh, usually the favorite books are the ones that you experienced in childhood and they had such an impact on you and they're... Uh, they're not always books that, that, that hold up over the decades, but they, you have that sentimental attachment to them anyway, uh, because they had such a huge impact on you at that time. You were just at the right time to receive a favorite book. So to read one that late, it must be really significant to you. So what, what is it about this book that, that brings you joy? Well, you know, as I was reading it this time through and, you know, with an eye towards answering, you know, invasive questions like this, <laughs> um, there's... Okay, on the first hand, it's a wonderful adventure tale, right? I mean, it's it's just a, a fantastic hero story. And if you just plot the story arc and the hurdles that our champions have to overcome and the difficulties they face, um, it's no different than any other epic story, right? It uh, You could put it alongside the Iliad. You could put it alongside Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, that sort of structure, you know, where you've got underdogs who set out on their own. They're beset by hurdles and dangers. They overcome, they overcome, and eventually ultimately triumph. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a rewarding story. Um, in addition to that, I mean, it's about rabbits, which is <laughs> utterly absurd, right? And, and that utterly absurd appeals to me. But in being about rabbits, the, the way that they're written, there's a simplicity to the rabbit psychology. Um, it's not Eden. It's, you know, the, the world is not a happy place to a rabbit inherently, right? They get bullied. They get eaten. Mm. Uh, they face starvation. They face all these challenges. But there's a simplicity to the rabbit psyche that, you know, if they're a bully, they're a bully. Um, if they're, you know, timid, they're timid. If they're stupid, they're stupid. Um, and they simply accept the world as they're given it. There's, there's not a lot of complexity. So you don't have to deal with following undertones and subplots and intentions. You know, everything is on the surface with these guys. So the rabbits are kind of archetypal. Yeah, they, they embody some principle and, and that's, their, that's their driving motivation. They're not complex, subtle, twisty, nuanced characters like most human beings. Right. Yeah. So there's a, there's a simplicity in it 
in that, you know, you never have to worry, well, what is his motivation at this point? Why is he acting in this way? You know, they, they act in predictable ways. They act consistently. Um, and yet they also integrate in predictable ways, or sometimes in unpredictable ways, but they integrate consistently. I think I'm going to throw out a word, uh, which I've been thinking about a lot in terms of, of the next book we're going to talk about, which I won't spoil yet. Um, but it's innocence. I think there's a sort of innocence to that sort of, of simplicity. Yeah, I would agree with that. And that's, and that's very appealing to return to a very... I mean, even though there's death and there's danger and there's, there's you know, there's bad guys and there's good guys, there's sort of innocence to that simplicity that's, that's very comforting. Yeah. Uh, it's enjoyable. Indeed. That's a, that, that encapsulates it nicely. That's, that's <laughs> what I enjoy about this book. There's a, there's a sense of, of, I don't know, almost relief and that yeah. I'm going to enjoy a rollicking good tale, but I don't have to spend a lot of brain power processing why is it unfolding this way. It's interesting. So you said it's it's epic is another word you threw out, and uh, and I think Adams does a really good job of creating this epic epic adventure in a space that is probably I didn't actually measure it out, but if you drew a map of the entire journey, it would be a couple of miles mm -hmm. on a side. Yeah, but because it's at the scale of rabbits, it really does have an epic feel to it because he really does a fantastic job of capturing their perspective. You yeah. know, which is you know they're they're a few inches off of the ground. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> and they're, they're not built for continual labor. They're not built for epic journeys, right? They're built for, you know, eating and digging and making little rabbits. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Here's the thing. We, we've talked uh, before about um, uh, problematic aspects of favorite books and how they hold up over time. What do you think of the treatment of the does in this book? Well, Rabbit Society <laughs> is certainly not a, a beacon of uh, equality. Uh, when it comes to gender or to race, for that yeah. matter, yeah. right? Um, those are, at least in this novel, those are subservient creatures. Um, they have roles. Well, all rabbits have roles, but every rabbit is comfortable with the fact that they have roles. Yeah. So, I mean, from a woke perspective, um, one would have to say that this is definitely not something that would make the feminist reading list, or if it was, it would be a negative example. But from a innocent, accept things as you find them perspective, you don't find the does complaining. True. So I also think uh, Adams has great cover here in that, you know, they're rabbits. We're not talking about human beings. They're not meant to be an analog for human beings as much as they do uh, embody some human traits. I don't think it's meant to be. I think Adams specifically says it's not meant to be a commentary on human society. Uh, and so we can posit this, this other, other society, which has these, you know, gender roles, which we wouldn't necessarily endorse for today. Um, but there you go. They're rabbits. Yeah, so, they're indeed rabbits. Yeah. And the does, of course, are highly valued. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, now when the, uh, when the initial adventurers set out on their, on their journey, it doesn't occur to them that they're all bucks, that they haven't taken any females along. You know, it's right. not until they get to a place of relative safety that they wake up and go, Hey, We've missed something here. <laughs> um, but once that happens, they go to great lengths, uh, extravagant personal and societal risks to try and get does to join them. And, and this, I think, is important. They go out to recruit does, not to take or to steal does, yes. but to get does to come with them. That's a good point. And everyone, every doe they find does want to willingly join their colony. They don't have to make do any undue pressure or anything against the does themselves. There are other obstacles that they run into. Indeed. Uh, the farmer who owns the first set of does they try to recruit and the um, uh, the very aggressive general, what was his name? That starts wound with Wart. Wound Wart. Yes, General Wound Wart and his, his obsessive need for control that allows him forces him to, to hang on to uh, a population that is actually undermining his authority and the functioning of his society that he's to set up. Because there's actually too many rabbits. They yeah. can't live free. They can't live comfortably. And yet he refuses to relinquish control. Well, his so. entire life has been a struggle, you know, from, uh, yeah. from surviving as a kitten, which, total sidebar, I did not know baby <laughs> rabbits were called kittens. I find that charming somehow. Yeah. Um, but, you know, from surviving as an outcast kitten to rise up not only to be the chief rabbit of this warren, but to be a, a, a dictator of a expanding, you know, militaristic style warren. Yeah. Um, the idea that there could be another way is simply alien to him. And you know, there's a there's a moment of choice in Douglas or Adams rather. I said Douglas Richard Adams. Adams. Richard, Richard Adams. Adams. Right. <laughs> Wrong Adams. Um, but Adams even you know writes it out. You know, there's a moment there when he's presented with a choice where he could actually 
you know, he's been approached by the watership down rabbits and they say, you know what, you've got more rabbits than you can handle. We don't have enough rabbits. If you let some go, we could actually start a third colony in between the two, you know, and, and he says, you know, Woundwort was given the moment to choose between being the rabbit of vision that he perceived himself to be or to keep on being a tyrant. I don't remember the exact phrasing. You know, I remember that. I remember that passage. It stands out as a, as a real inflection point. Yep. And, uh, and then he chooses the darker path. Well, he might choose the darker path, or it might go back to this idea that rabbits are simply too simple, mm. right? As we were talking about earlier, they, they are archetypal. They are without subtext. Yeah. Um, he has fought literally his entire life to become what he is. It's not terribly surprising that he's incapable of doing anything yeah. else. So this, um, this quest for the does is interesting because structurally, uh, you compare this to the Iliad and Lord of the Rings, uh, and to me it feels very different. Well, I, I, the Iliad and Lord of the Rings don't really compare actually directly. <laughs> uh, I was thinking of uh, Lord of the Rings and other fantasy type um, adventure novels. And, and it's very distinct from that because it starts off as a quest. I mean, we have this great vision and they go off on a quest. And then very shortly, in very short order, they achieve their quest. They're at Watership Down in the first, I don't know, quarter of the book or something like that. And you're like, oh, well, that was a short quest. Um, and they have a little adventure there. And then it's almost like the, the second half of the book is a separate book. It's really, you know, the quest for the does. It's a whole separate thing. So that, that journey away from um, where they are because of uh, Fiverr's vision mm -hmm. um, and landing at Watership Down uh, is almost the first chunk of the book. And then there's this whole separate chunk, which is, oh, we're here, we achieved our utopia, but our utopia has no, has no future because we have no does. Uh, so now we've got to do that. It almost feels like a separate book. If I recall correctly, the, the book is actually subdivided, the novel subdivided into four books. Um, Oh, yeah, yeah. I, Richard, yeah, Adams does divide it into four, something like so, that. So, yeah, the, the journey from uh, Sandalwood, was that the name of the, the original so, yeah. war, from the original war, and is this the first part? Um, and that, you're right, the, a lot of the challenges are, are shoehorned into that first part, right? So, I mean, they, they have the, uh, the initial flight, which is its own thing. Um, they have the false start. They have the um, the civilized rabbits, yeah. um, and then ultimately, they, you know, fleeing from that, they end up at Watership. Then they have the whole Doe quest, which leads them to, uh, to the conflict with Woundwort. Yeah. And then they've got the epilogue, the ha happily ever after part. So, I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's not a linear comparison to these things, but in the, in the scale of it, again, you, you're starting with a, a, a disenfranchised minority population who, mm -hmm. um, you know, is battling... First, they have to battle to get out of the, the initial warren, right? Yeah. Even the fact that they want to leave and go off on their own is, is a challenge. They have to, to fight the Owslow on their way out. Um, I had a point. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I didn't. I was thinking, so in the introduction, Adam says that he came up with these stories uh, for his, his daughters, I believe. He his told two daughters. He told them on road trips. And, and that was fascinating to me because the first part really made sense to me. It's like, this feels like a road trip story, story you would tell your kids. The first part of the book feels like that. And the second part of the book doesn't feel like that. It really... Um, it's almost like, again, it's like, to me, it felt like two books stuck together or like a, a book and a sequel uh, combined in one volume. And the first part is really a traditional fantasy quest almost. Um, and the second part is more of a heist. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it's a, well, heist is the wrong word. Uh, it's more like a prison break. Yeah. Um, heists are more playful. Uh, and the second part of the book is very, very dark. Um, and it did not feel like a story you would tell to your children. It was surprising to me. Uh, and I'm wondering if he, if he started off the book with stories that he told to his kids and then sort of just kept going in this one direction, if that sort of like grabbed him and he had to see it through to his conclusion or something. That wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah. Definitely some of the, I mean, the elaborate battle plans and infiltration plans, at least by rabbit standards, yeah. uh, you know, and even to the point of having a secret web or two secret weapons, right? They have mm -hmm. the, the seagull and they have a raft. Yes. On the, oh my God, what is floating on the water? You know, and just the sidebar there, some of the, the descriptions when he, he has the rabbit encounter these absolutely mundane things to us. <laughs> and, you know, the amount of wonder and the amount of processing that it takes them to figure out 
you know, um, when Big Wig is caught by the snare and he says you have to sever the peg, you know, and they have to stop and think about what can this possibly mean? You know, they don't know what a wire is, what a peg is, where to find the peg, what severing it means. There was a thing he talked about from the rabbit's perspective it was the men walking around with glowing sticks. And I had no idea what he was talking about for most of the book uh, until he gave a more explicit reference that made me realize that they were cigarettes. Yeah. All men smoke. We have yeah. discovered this in Watership <laughs> Down. All, all humans smoke. Yes. Uh, with the notable exception of the little girl at, yeah. the, at the farm. Um, I had a point about the... Um, Oh, I'm going to skip ahead to something else, actually. Go right ahead. So, <laughs> how, how did the dialect work for you uh, for the gull and uh, who's the other character that had a dialect? Was the field mouse. The field mouse. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, well, this actually opens a little bit larger topic of discussion, which I did want to get into, which is the, the language itself. Mm -hmm. um, he specifically addresses the fact that when animals communicate between species, there's a, there's a shared patois um, yes. called hedgerow. Uh, now, the fact that that hedgerow sounded just like you would expect a, a, a Creole or a patois to sound like on the streets of Little China or Little Vietnam or something like that. Um, well, I mean, this is all interpreted to human speak, right? Yeah. So we're, we're not rabbits or field mice or, or, or seagulls. We're, we're working with our own limited understanding and our limited vocabulary and vocal cords. So, you know, it, it translates to something that's equivalent. Um, I love the fact that he took the time to address not all animals speak the same language, but with effort, they can communicate to each other in fashion. Yeah, I think that's, that's a great, that's a great idea. Uh, what did you, how did you feel about the implementation of it in this book? Um, Again, this is a place where it does not shine in terms of being a woke idea. Um, it's certainly very uh, reminiscent of what you would hear in comedies depicting black people as inferior, you know, from a from an earlier age. Yeah, I got I got that impression also, and I kept trying to shake it off. I'm like, no, he he, you know, because it is a it is a pigeon or a creole, and he does make that explicit, and and people do talk like that, and that's okay, but. One of the things that was was grating at me was that, uh, you know, presumably the rabbits would also have to speak in this pigeon to communicate with the seagull, but they didn't. The rabbits were still fully articulate, uh, which was a great deal of rabbit privilege from Adams, I thought. <laughs> rabbit <laughs> privilege. Lapine privilege. Yeah. Lapine privilege, yeah. I... Because people do code shift all the time in Hawaii. We experience that. You know, people speak in standard English and they switch into pidgin, uh, sometimes fluidly within the context of one sentence. Um, and sometimes people will, you know, uh, a standard English speaker will speak to a pidgin speaker and back and forth and they'll stick to their own, whatever their preferred thing is. But in this sense, it really seemed like, you know, if the rabbits are going to talk to the seagull, and this is the way the seagull can communicate, the seagull comes across as less bright than the rabbits because he's dealing with a limited vocabulary and awkward grammar, which is not his first language. Mm -hmm. And the rabbits do not suffer that. And I, and I think that's unfair. I, I don't know why. I don't, I, it doesn't matter. No one needs to stick up for seagulls and rabbits are not privileged in our society. I don't know why that bothers me, but it does. <laughs> well, I mean, you, you can certainly read a lot into that, no doubt. Um, and, you know, that's not even a point I'm going to try to contest. I mean, it's absolutely that way. You know, whenever there's an initial, it's like, hi, you're a field mouse. I will indulge in the hedgerow for a moment or two so we can establish communication. And then I will shift into regular lepine and yeah. uh, speak articulately and clearly. And fortunately, you will understand everything I say and be able to respond enough that I can understand most of the time what you mean. Yeah. I also, I have a pet peeve. As a reader, uh, I don't like to read... Um, uh, I don't like to read non-standard orthography. Uh, so and this goes for pigeon also. When I read a pigeon play or something like that, I prefer it to be standard orthography as much as possible because anytime you put in the apostrophes and the alternate spellings and whatnot, uh, it, it really slows me down as a reader. And for something, if you're reading a play script, I think a lot of these things are cues for the actors and they're important. And if you're reading a novel, I think you can get by with a lot less of that and just really be suggestive of it and not just kind of like drag you through each of these awkward constructions word by word. So that's just my, my preference as a reader. Okay. Well, if I ever get a chance to talk to Richard, I'll pass that along. Is he still alive? No, he, he passed <laughs> some time ago. I looked him okay. up on Wikipedia just before this. All right. 
Uh, but back to the, the idea of the language, um, I love, and, and again, there's a strong parallel with Tolkien here, but I love the fact that he actually developed at least a partial language for the rabbit. That was um, fascinating. Yeah. And, you know, there, there are, are terms that I've incorporated. Uh, uh, my favorite um, nerdy insult for people now is Silfle Fraca. Do you happen to remember those two words? Silfle is going out to feed, right? Silfle is eating, going out to feed or whatnot. Yeah. Hraka is what you pass when you're done eating. Oh, huh. <laughs> okay. So there's, and it's actually something that, uh, that Bigwig says to Woundwart um, in their final confrontation when Woundwart, you know, is trying to bully him into backing down. And says, Silfle Hraka, and then, you know, <laughs> blows are enjoined. Joined. Tharn was the one word I remembered from yeah. my, my first reading of it way, way back when. Yeah. Yeah. To, to go completely just frozen. Yeah. In, Deer in, in the headlights. Yeah. Stupefied. Yeah. And that is often, uh, going back to our earlier thing, often that word is followed by the word dough. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's, there's, there are several references to the, to the doughs going Tharn. Um, yeah. Again, woke we're not. Well, I think, I mean, in the rabbit society, this is something we haven't talked about yet. There is, um, the does are all sort of of a piece, all any, any doe is any doe. They don't distinguish themselves in any particular way. But on the male side, there's very much a hierarchy. Uh, there is a, there is a leader of a warren. Um, what do they call the leader of the warren? Chief rabbit. Chief rabbit. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, uh, the officers. The Ausla. The Ausla, right. Uh, and it's a pretty rigid hierarchy, even in the, um, even what we think of as the hero Warren, they still maintain an Alice and they still have a pretty rigid hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and that just seems to be part built into all rabbits everywhere, even though we run into a couple of other Warrens with, with different, um, uh, I don't want to call them ideologies. Uh, they're set up differently. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, they run on slightly different principles, but they all share that they all share this this sort of flat hierarchy for the does and a rigid uh, hierarchy for the, uh, for the male, for the bucks. Yeah. Indeed. Yep. Nothing to challenge there. <laughs> that's, that's, that <laughs> I'm just, the just it throwing is. it out. No, I'm trying yeah. to challenge you. No, I, if, uh, <laughs> he did write, uh, I hesitate to call it a sequel, but many years later he did write Tales from Watership Down. Right. Um, and uh, that book, I, I have read it. I enjoyed Watership Down so much I couldn't not read it. Um, it, in my opinion, falls flat, in part because it's not a cohesive novel. It's a collection of short stories, mm -hmm. uh, some of which are rabbit mythology, some of which are um, continuing stories at the Watership Down. And in those continuing stories at the Watership Down, uh, it turns out that Hazel's uh, mate, Heisenflay, I think. Um, but anyway, she actually becomes co-chief rabbit. Interesting. Um, so, you know, there is evolution that we don't see in, in our book. <laughs> It actually happens in this book. I mean, for all their talk about the does being, you know, basically interchangeable uh, and, and treating them as if they're less significant than the male rabbits, as soon as they rescue the does from General Woundwart's Warren, they, they become full equals. Uh, I don't think they join the Ausla, but they, their opinions are respected. Uh, they have input on all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they're not, they're not in any way less than but it's just this weird sort of attitude. And maybe it's just because they're all bucks at the beginning yeah. or maybe he has a shift well, in attitude. As I guess writing. you can see there, there is some challenging of, of standard rabbit gender roles there. Um, also you've got, uh, you know, he expressly, we find out several times that digging is does work. Um, <laughs> yes. But you do in fact have the bucks um, do the initial digging, creating the warren at uh, Watership. Now, of course there are no does. So, yes. you know, it's either that or not have one, but even if it's under duress, nonetheless, you've got the, the bucks assuming a typically female um, role there, typically female job. Yeah. There's a, there's a bit of that um, the, in that they're starting a new thing and they kind of have to, they, they, they bring with them a lot of assumptions from their old warren. And as they find themselves in new circumstances, they have to reject a lot of these assumptions because pragmatism takes over and it's just like we have to do what we have to do this isn't going to yeah. work so we can't just you know afford to coast on what we thought we knew so and that's a perfect example of that is the bucks having to do the digging because there are no does but also just you know what are we going to do right well we yeah. want a warren yeah. so yeah we have claws we can dig so i don't know maybe this this is a step towards a rabbit utopian society the fact that they had to start cold right it's not like they left with a viable colony um, or under peaceful circumstances, right? So that is a 
and now it wish makes me wish I picked a different book for next time. But that is a that is a wonderful sort of idea is that everybody thinks they can build a utopia by throwing out the old ideas and starting from scratch. It's like we get rid of all this baggage, but people can never get rid of all that baggage because they yeah. grew up in the old society. They always bring some of those assumptions with them. So how much can you build a utopia? I mean, you'd have to keep, you know, you'd have to abandon that utopia for a new utopia. Uh, and then you still carry the baggage of that failed utopia with you. Um, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I mean, they, they defy so many rabbit conventions, right? I mean, we've, we've talked a little bit about the gender roles, but typically in the, what we're given to understand from rabbit society, the chief rabbit is the biggest, most badass rabbit, period, end mm -hmm. of story. And yet what we have in the Watership Down, Hazel is a run of the mill buck. He's not particularly big. He's not particularly aggressive. He's not particularly bright. Yeah. Um, and because he's been in that middle of the road position, he doesn't make decisions that will impinge on other people, right? The other rabbits mm. respect him for the fact that he's not taking advantage, at least the little guys, which is most of the Warren. And his number one advisor is a runt, mm -hmm. you know, a, a, a brain damaged runt. Poor little yeah. Fiverr has no respect for anyone in the Warren except for his brother Hazel. Um, yeah. You know, and he, the only one that actually believed in the visions uh, that Fiverr said we've got to leave is Hazel. Everybody else that left with them left because they were simply disgruntled. Yes. Life at the Warren wasn't quite good enough and they were looking for the next best thing. Yeah. Um, That's an interesting take on leadership also because, I mean, Hazel is the leader who has to be, who has to earn his leadership privileges over and over and over again, which mm -hmm. he does by making good decisions and by listening to other people's input, other rabbit's input. Uh, <laughs> whereas Woundwort enforces his leadership with uh, strength and ruthless discipline, you know? Um, and, uh, it's a, it's a real contrast. It's interesting, other than the commonalities between the Warrens that we see, we don't know what general society is like. We have four examples and that's it, right? True. Yeah. So, so what are rabbits really like? We, you know, who knows? Uh, yeah, we, we get a little bit more than that because, you know, um, Adams does speak to us in the omniscient narrator voice from time to time talking about you know, rabbit society. And he does, structures. that's true. He does a little bit. Um, and constantly, he gives a lot of credit to a, a documentary book on the secret life of rabbits that uh, I really, every time I pick this book up and read it, I'm like, <laughs> the very next thing I'm going to do is go out and find that book and read it. And I've never gotten around to actually doing that. So what did you think of, um, he also claims that the, the, the other warns are not intended to be, or the book itself is not intended to be an allegory. Like, like Tolkien famously said that Lord of the Rings is not an allegory for anything. It's just an adventure. And people insist on reading into it that it's a commentary on World War I, or it's about race, or it's about this, or it's about that. Uh, and, and Adam says, this is not. This is not an allegory. And yet we run into uh, a couple of warrens, which are organized significantly different from our initial warren that they flee from, and the new warren, which they set up, that seem to be bad, that seem to be relevant to stuff that might have been relevant to England about the time that Adams was writing. Well, I, on the one hand, he may well not have, he may have chosen that this is not supposed to represent anything, mm -hmm. but there's only a handful of stories, <laughs> right? The, the actual number of stories that exist, uh, there, there's different philosophies on that. Are there seven of them? Are there 13 of them? Whatever. Um, and then there's a finite amount of experience that the author has to draw from. Um, and a finite amount of imagination that he has, in which, well, maybe not finite, maybe imagination is infinite, I don't know. But you can pick it, just about any book you want to, and make it an allegory to something, right? Yeah. There's going to be parallels in structure, there's going to be parallels in appearance and development in something that remind you of, hey, this reminds me of Ringling Brothers' Barnum and Bailey Circus, yeah, yeah. right? Clearly this book is a, is a um, tell-all expose of the circus industry. I think it's fair. I think we could take him at his word that he didn't have an intentional allegory and that maybe his experience, I mean, obviously his experience just seeps into the book. I mean, what else yeah. do you have to write from but your experience? Um, it's interesting in that I was thinking of, I was thinking of other books I would compare this to. Uh, and one of them was uh, Gulliver's Travels. Okay, yeah. Uh, in that the rabbits go around and they see a bunch of other societies which they don't like uh, and, and, they, and then they come back uh, to, to one that they do like. Yeah, so it's just like, oh, well, we could be organized like this, we could be organized like that. What are the flaws here? What are the flaws there? Um, and they don't have a meeting about this, but there's a there's a rejection of those alternatives that they... Yep. And there's even some adopting, though, of the culture. So when they set up to dig their new war, and one of the things they want is that large 
communal space oh, that's that, a they, good point. that they had. At the, yeah. uh, and I can't remember the name of the, the civilized Warren. Or maybe it didn't even have a name. Is there air quotes on civilized? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, but the, the one with the, uh, the, robot, the robots, the rabbits that had developed poetry and art, um, you know, but in fact were nothing more than a man's larder. Yes. Um, but, you know, so th- they did see something that they liked from their journey and incorporate that idea into their new society. But uh, more so, you're right. They, they looked for the things that they didn't like and they avoided them. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent point. That's something that some people have a hard time doing is is you look at something and you reject it and you reject it wholesale entirely. But they were able to pick and choose. That was a that was clearly a dysfunctional society. They were, um, you know, these rabbits were. It's not just that they were a larder for the uh, for the farmers. It's that they were in complete denial about it. Yeah. That was the that was the terrifying part of that of the story was that they, there were things that they couldn't talk about. They were forbidden topics because to acknowledge that they were at some point going to be harvested for food, uh, would to, would be to undercut their entire society. So they just denied it completely. You could never ask where anyone was. Exactly. Because maybe they were gone. Yeah. Maybe they had stopped (laughs) running. Yeah. But, uh, but rather than just rejecting them entirely, they did take, you know, what did they like from there? The, uh, the big, the big central war. Yeah, that was, that was the one and only thing, right? <laughs> the fact that the architecture was nice. Yeah. And that it was under a tree, right? It, so was, they had it a, worked because it was under a tree. Exactly. In that place. You know, they, they couldn't duplicate it, but they came up with a, basically a honeycomb. Yeah. Big honeycomb area so that you could still smell and talk to everybody at the same time. Yeah. All right, so I feel like I feel like I'm challenging you on this book, and that's not my intention. So, oh, no, no, uh, no. talk talk more about what you love about it. Uh, <laughs> Again, it's reading this and putting yourself in the perspective of a rabbit. Um, and again, I, I think that he just does that. Uh, Adams just does a phenomenal job of representing these creatures that do not have the the capability of intellectual thought that we do. Um, and in a way, I think they're just. Again, this was stories told to children, at least initially, and clearly this is, is designed as a children's book. Um, but I think it, it brings me back to that sense of wonder when I knew less about the world than I do today, or at least I thought I knew less about the world than I do today. Um, but anyway, that, that sense of, you know, the, the things that they come across the first time they encounter a road and the fact that they are just so flabbergasted. What is this thing? Oh, yeah. Uh, it, yeah. It what do they call the road? They call it some kind of river. I don't remember. I'm embarrassed to say I don't remember. No, I don't, I don't you know, But only one of them had ever, uh, one of the Owsla had encountered the road and was the only one that knew about it. You know, and then the cars coming along, the hoo doo doo The hoo doo doo You know, but the fact that, uh, you know, them being so terrified of it and not realizing how it's indifferent to them. And, you know, these, these moments in which you know what's going on and they don't, but you, you see them trying to puzzle their way through something that, again, is just so mundane and so commonplace to you. The, the floating on the river with the, with the raft, you know, yeah. the, the fact that, you know, some of them, even though they survived because they went through this, they still don't have any idea what happened. Yeah. You know, it's, it's from their perspective, it's a du sex machina, right? It's, yeah. they were saved by, a, you know, Lord Rainbow reached down and delivered them because they simply can't understand what happened. Um, I love that sense of wonder, that sense of naivete, um, that, to go back to your word, that innocence that, uh, that I feel when I'm reading and, you know, living through these exploits with them. Yeah. I, like, I really enjoyed that sense of, of experience in another culture, even if it's an entirely made-up culture. I, I assume that... Uh, that Adams has some some working knowledge of real rabbits. I mean, it feels very authentic, apart from uh, you know, apart from the um, the obviously anthropomorphic uh, aspects mm. that, he, that he added to them. Um, but it feels grounded in reality. Uh, I think you know, it's fascinating the contrast between what he thinks is needs to be explained to the reader, what he thinks needs to be explained from the rabbit's perspective, and what he takes for granted that the reader already knows. I was looking up words on every page, which were just like weird names for uh, um, plants and so on. And he would just mm-hmm. toss out, it's like, you just, of course you know this word. I don't remember what they are. I was like, what? I have never seen this word in my life. <laughs> yeah, and, and some of this, I wonder if it's a, a British American thing. And some of this, I wonder if it's a generational thing. But uh, a Lindry. What the hell was a lindry? You know, we're supposed to know what a lindry is. Finally, it's, it's a badger. Right? Oh, right. <laughs> How did I learn a lindry is a badger? About 10 minutes ago when I was looking at the Wikipedia page about the language, I came across, oh, that's, 
that is one of the great things about reading on Kindle is that the dictionary is right there. You just yeah. highlight the word and it pops right up. And I was doing that a lot in this book. Um, I think, I think it is a shift. I think, um, you know, over, over the past few decades that people have become less to our detriment in some ways, uh, less immediately experiential and more, um, um, our experiences have been modulated. Uh, so we, we, we don't appreciate things in their context. We spend, I'm trying to say we spend less time outdoors. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm trying to say. Okay, so you're yeah. from that well-fed Warren, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that back in the day, people lived their lives outside. They had knowledge of the the earth and the sky. Uh, it was it was significant of which constellations were, were visible and when and why. And now it's like, I, I don't know anybody who knows what the constellations are, uh, let alone can predict them, uh, who could name, unless they're a botanist, could name any plants that they're walking past. Because that's, you know, but they know, you know, they know who all the Powerpuff Girls are. Uh, <laughs> you know, they, we live our lives online, in media, and mediated by, curated. Our lives are curated for us by our various interests that we follow, as opposed to just being out there and raw. So... And there's, there's a bunch of rabbits who rejected that. They, they left their curated <laughs> experience in the yeah. first warren and set out to create their own. Yep. All right. All right. Are we wrapping up? I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Any final thoughts you want to contribute before we wind um, it down? If you're looking for something that is relatively simple to read, um, full of joy, and yet not just, you know, drivel, this, this has got substance to it in a number of levels. Um, I think this is just a, a fantastic and rare example of something that where those two Venn diagrams overlap, something that's fun and simple to read simply because it is fun and simple, and yet something that is a story worth sinking your teeth into. It's definitely got a surprising amount of depth for a book about rabbits. It is, it is not fluffy. It is not... You not know, fluffy. I like that. Uh, <laughs> the other book I immediately think of when I think of as soon as I know this is a story for his kids is I think of uh, Alice in Wonderland, which is which is nonsensical uh, and and light and entertaining. Uh, it was one of my favorite books growing up, but but I think doesn't hold up the way that this does it because it doesn't have that depth and that richness and that consistency. Uh, it's not grounded in the same way. It's a Alice in Wonderland is a very very silly book. Um, yeah, and, and it's lacking in the sort of arc and overall achievement that, yeah. uh, that we find in our characters in Watership Down. Yeah. So this has a surprising amount of depth for what is intended to, well, I don't know how it was intended as a book, but what began as a children's story. And I know one of his, he had an issue publishing it because people said this is a children's story, but it's written like it's for adults. Yeah. And I think that's part of its, its lasting charm and, and its longevity is that it, it takes itself so seriously. And that it is grounded. Yeah. So. So I hope you've enjoyed our uh, inaugural flight through Watership Down here on Thumbing Through Yesterday. Uh, we'll have another episode out in two weeks. Absolutely two weeks. You can hold me to it. And we will be discussing one of Heinlein's early works, Have Spacesuit Will Travel, a favorite of Tony's. Mm -hmm.